As we just read from Matthew chapter 20, 17 through 19, this is the third explicit, clear time that Jesus in this gospel has specifically referred to the fact that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to go to the cross, they were going to kill him, and he was going to be raised again from the dead. And there was two other times when he used the uh, Old Testament uh, prophetic fulfillment of what's called the sign of Jonah. And we're going to talk about those a little later in the sermon, but this is just so, this is so amazing, this is so profound, and, and we're, going to, we're going to go through this today. Um, and my hope and prayer is, uh, if there's a method to the madness of my preaching schedule this year, it is that we prepare our hearts and minds for Easter, which is coming up next week is Palm Sunday, and uh, we plan on on uh, having the Lord's Supper after the service here at our uh, as we gather together in person um, next week, and then the following week is Easter, and there's already uh, a, an amazing, wonderful the Lord's bringing together. Uh, worship sets and choir and children singing and music and praise and baptism on Easter Sunday. What a celebration we're going to have. And I just, I, I want us, I want to invite us to stand in awe again, all over again, at the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is, I, I wrote a word and I'm going to explain it. There is a timelessness to the plan of God to save sinners in Jesus Christ, even before creation. Now, timelessness, I struggled with the word. Timeless, what does it mean, timeless? We throw that word around in our culture like, oh, you know, that's timeless. What do we even mean by that? So I actually came up with another description of the same thing I'm trying to get across. There is an eternal reality to the plan of God to save sinners in Jesus Christ, even before creation. Please bear with me. I, I'm going I'm to mention the, 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 the site, the verse, chapter, and number where these are found. But just listen, may I pray the, the scriptures as the living word of, of God just wash over us. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in what's known as the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, verse 5 said, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. In that same high priestly prayer in John 17, verse 24, Jesus said, Father, I I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you loved me before the foundation of the world. In Ephesians 1.3, the Apostle Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. In verse 4 in Ephesians 1, which I just read, let me, let me, let me recap that. And, and you know, sometimes it helps. Anybody, knew, anybody do the five W's? Who, what, when? Why do they call them the five W's? Who, what, when, where, how, and why? They put an H in there. It's five W's and an H, but we call it the five W's. Anyway, that thing. You know I'm talking about that thing. Listen to this idea. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. That's Ephesians 1, 3. Just as, this is verse 4, he is the who, chose us is the what, in him is the where, before the foundation of the world is the when. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 1.17, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves and fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood 
as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. In Jude 25, the benediction closes, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Past, present, future. But those wonderful, amazing, simple little words there, before all time. In Hebrews 13.8, it simply states, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And then in Matthew 25, to which we will relatively soon arrive as we, as we are preaching through the book of Matthew, Jesus says in Matthew 25, 34, and following that the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And so, as we get to Matthew chapter 20, 17, 18, and 19, the third explicit time, the fifth time including the sign of Jonah references, you see, Jesus, Emmanuel, son of Abraham, son of David, son of God, son of man, tells the 12 apostles, they're going to kill me. And don't just read the scriptures, please, I pray, I beg you, as a pastor teacher in the church of Jesus Christ, don't just read the scriptures with the idea of, of and we have a saying in our, in our culture today, right? Um, familiarity breeds contempt. Don't just read the scriptures like, oh, I knew that. Okay, no, I want you to see something. Look at Matthew 17, 18, and 19 again. As Jesus is about to go to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside by themselves, and on the way he says to them, Behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, we're going to talk about that, will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. He knew exactly the kind of people that he was going to be falsely accused by. And they will condemn him to death. He knew the sentence of the trial as before the trial happened. And will hand him over to the Gentiles. Oh, so the, 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 the priests and the scribes weren't going to do the dirty work, but the Roman soldiers were. To mock and discourage and to crucify him. So he knew that he would be crucified. That could have killed him any number of 50 different ways. So Emmanuel, God in the flesh, with his disciples, right before this happens. And by the way, one of the conclusions to my sermon today is this. The rest of the Gospel of Matthew from chapter 21 to chapter 28, happens in the span of one week. What's the one week? It's what many Christians call Holy Week. It's that whole series of events that happens between, between Palm Sunday when Jesus enters Jerusalem and then a week later, Easter Sunday, when he's risen from the dead and then he gives his disciples the command, the Great Commission, to go and make disciples of all nations. One week. So here we are on the eve, as it were, not literally, I'm not using that term as a day. I'm saying we're right on the precipice of all of these events. And what does Jesus say to his disciples again? Not just for the first time. I know what they're going to do. I know in detail what they're going to do. So when you see it before your eyes, know that I told you first. I know what they're going to do. Here's the best part of it. He also knows what God's going to do. And on the third day, he will be raised up. You see, there is an eternal reality. There is a timelessness to the plan of God that Jesus knew. There is an eternal reality that is seen through all of the scriptures that should wash away every doubt, every fear, every mis communication, every 
unclear thought about who Jesus is and what he came to do. I've sometimes heard people say, well, don't you think God could have done it some other way? Wait, y'all. Before the foundation of the world, God set this in motion and knew he was going to do it. So there's not just a timelessness, there is an eternal reality. And we sometimes read the scriptures from that human circumstantial point of view of, well, if this happened, then that could happen. If that happened, then this could happen. And we get all clouded up and confused. And I, I think God wants to take all that confusion away and to you as a believer and me as a believer and say, I had a plan. I told you my plan. I planned my plan. I did my plan. I fulfilled my plan. And now in my plan, you're part of it too. God knew this all along. Glorious, eternal weight of this timeless plan of God to save. Now, I want you to watch how he unfolds, unpacks, explains that here in this passage and, and look for some very key, important theological terms like son of man and son of David and, and what's going on here. And so if we're going to understand that the, the way of the king is sacrificial service. We're going to see as we approach Easter coming up with Palm Sunday next week and Easter week two weeks from now, three weeks from now, depending on how you count, um, the king and the cross today. But the, we're, this, is, this is about Jesus' own prophetic understanding and proclamation that he was going to go to the cross. And notice in, in Matthew 20, 17, um, and 18 and 19. Look at, in verse 18. Behold, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and scribes. Okay. Now we read that, and we say, Son of Man. That, that doesn't fall on our ears the way it should. If we do our Bible, it would fall on our ears more like this. Son of Man is the phrase that Daniel used in Daniel 7, 9 through 14. In Daniel 7, 9 through 14, this is, I'm, I want to read it for us. This is something that is central to, to Jesus using this, this, it's a self-title that Jesus gives to himself. <laughs> that was redundant. I said it twice. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, people, you know, what does son of man mean? Watch. Just listen carefully. Daniel 7, 9 and following. I kept looking until thrones were set up in the ancient of days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the chair, the, excuse me, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. We're welcomed into a vision in Daniel, a vision of the ancient of days enthroned. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Now we're holding court with witnesses. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire judgment. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them from an appointed period of time. Daniel 7.13 goes on. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. Now we have a biblical, Old Testament, anchored, written, reference, and definition. One like a son of man was coming. Listen to how he's described. And he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So every time Jesus says, the Son of Man, referring to himself, we should be thinking, oh, the Ancient of Days gives an eternal kingdom 
to the Son of Man, and that kingdom will never be destroyed. And people from every nation, language, tribe, and tongue are going to worship him. And he holds judgment, and he will judge, and he will prevail. What? You see? Read your scriptures, right? So Jesus, with the twelve, who should have known, says, we're going to Jerusalem. And if it wasn't enough, because we're kind of Westerners, and we kind of like the idea of the details and the scientific look at things, and, and we said, well, he knew it was Jerusalem, and he knew it was going to be um, um, scribes and Pharisees, and he knew it was going to be turned over to the Gentiles. He even knew that he was going to be crucified, this kind of death he was going to suffer, and then God was going to raise him from If that wasn't enough, he calls himself Son of Man. What is Jesus proclaiming to his followers? I'm the one. It's me. I'm the one whose kingdom is going to be forever. And by the way, all the nations are going to worship me. Is it any wonder then that in the span of, of earthly time in a week, but in the span of verse, uh, chapters 21 to 28 to the end of the book of, of the Gospel of Matthew, is it any wonder, wonder then that we get to what's called the Great Commission in Matthew 28? When Jesus, upon his rising again from the dead, says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things I've commanded you, and I'm with you to the end of the age. This is the king reigning in glory, sending his followers to do the work of the Son of Man so that the nations would worship him. But what does he have to do between Matthew 20 and Matthew 28? What, what does the king, don't forget, the whole book of Matthew is about Matthew the apostle showing text by text through the Old Testament how Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets, how Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament. This is a superlative, superior fulfillment of all Old Testament teaching. Finds its absolute fulfillment in the person of Jesus Christ. And what happens for Jesus to reign in between chapter 20 and chapter 28. What happens? They kill him. What happens? He's crucified. What happens? Even death can't keep him dead. God raised him from the dead. And so Jesus is eternal king of God's eternal kingdom. And he is enthroned through the cross and the resurrection. How powerful. So do you and I feel, do you and I see, do you and I fall on our faces when we're reading scripture and just go, this was the eternal plan. He knew this all along. And, and instead of looking at the cross and the gospel and all of these events that happen at Easter time as we talk about them, instead of looking at them with even a shred of a less than one half of one percent in our hearts kind of doubt about, well, why would God have to do such a thing? What if we just had 110 percent worship about how God did such a thing? And he planned it all along. And he fulfilled it. And he did it. Before the foundation of the world. You see, Peter's going to later on go on to write, actually proclaim, Luke writes it in, in the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter the Apostle, who by the way, he's one of the 12 there with Jesus at this time. But on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, this is how Peter essentially concludes that, that, that great Pentecost sermon where 3,000 people are pierced to the heart. What shall we do? Repent, believe, be baptized for your salvation. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, Peter says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. That was the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was the plan all along. Wow. Jesus then in Matthew 20, verse 20, goes on. He shows his followers the, the fact that he's the ultimate example of sacrificial service, that Jesus is the ultimate example 
of sacrificial service. Please read with me in Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, we are able. Now, you realize the cup I'm about to drink, he just explained what that was. It's persecution, it's suffering, it's sacrifice. He just told them, I'm going to go be crucified. They're going to kill me. This is a rabbinic parable, parable kind of way to say the cup I'm about to drink. It's, this, is, this is the predetermined plan of suffering. Are you going to do that too? Are you going to follow me too? Are you willing to do that? You, you want to... You you want to reign in my kingdom? You want to sit one on my right hand and one on the left hand? You, you want to rule with me? You want to suffer with me? You see? We are able, they reply. He said to them, my cup you shall drink. Oh, okay. So you are going to suffer. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by the Father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. See, I'd love to read Scripture and follow the audience very carefully, right? Because in verse 17, it started with Jesus on the way to Jerusalem, taking the twelve and telling the twelve about the gospel. Prophesied teaching that he would die and be crucified, be crucified, die, and be raised again from the dead. But then two, in verse 20, mommy, mommy wants the best for her sons. Mommy wants the best. Okay, Jesus, come on. Give them authority. Interestingly, look at verse 24. Hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. <laughs> so the ten are like, come on, man. Are you serious, mom? This is just a little bit more evidence. And it happens throughout the whole Gospel of Matthew that there are times when the followers of Jesus get it. They get what's going on. They get it. It's powerful. It's life-changing. It's transformational. And then there are times when the disciples of Jesus just kind of look like two-by-fours. They just don't get it. It's a like, duh. God Almighty, Son of Man, crucified and raised again from the dead, and they're over in the corner arguing about who gets to sit next to him and have authority? Duh. Is that the kind of authority we're supposed to seek and have and is that the kind of arrogance that we're supposed to live our faith with and watch what happens jesus called them to himself and said in matthew 20 25 you know that the rulers of the gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them this is the way of the world this is the way of power and authority and government the rulers of the gentiles rule over people Sometimes with a, we say, iron fist. Look at what Jesus says in verse 26. It is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall become your servant. And whoever wishes to become first among you shall become your slave. Just as the Son of Man, there it is again. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for the many. And so the Lord corrects their view yet again. The Son of Man came to serve. If your master and my master, if your Savior and my Savior, if your God and my God, Emmanuel, if Jesus, the Son of Man, to whom all authority and an eternal kingdom is given and in fulfillment of Daniel 7, if God came to serve, who are we to lord it over others? We should live in service like our king lived in service. If you wish to be first, then become last, which we actually already covered from Matthew 19, 30 and 20, verse 8 and 20, verse 16. This becomes a theme as Jesus is approaching the cross. It actually becomes a theme 
of discipleship. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm going to master all of you and tell you what to do and lord it over you and make you do and make you not do, and I'm going to control. Is that really the way it's supposed to work? No. Peter would go on to write, not unlike, I think Peter got it. Eventually, he got it. Not unlike, I just read from Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter would go on later to write 1 Peter, and in 1 Peter 5, listen to the Apostle Peter's words. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ. The cup, the sufferings. And a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Now this is Peter speaking to shepherds or pastors. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but providing to be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus Christ, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So I think Peter got it. At least he figured it out by the time he wrote the letter. Peter got it. So, Think about the dynamics of what we're studying together today as we worship the Lord in his word. The timelessness and eternal reality of the gospel. Even the 12 having some last minute division among them, the 10 versus the 2, or I should say the 2 versus the 10. And now, Jesus on the way to the cross saying, Don't do this like the world does. Don't lord it over people. Serve. Why? Because I'm the son of man, and I came to serve and to die for you. So you serve too. Jesus is the ultimate example of sacrificial service. The ultimate example of sacrificial service. This is what has led men and women in the church of our Savior Jesus Christ for more than 2,000 years to go to great lengths to sacrifice life, limb, material things, even precious things like time with family to serve Jesus Christ, his gospel and his kingdom, sacrificially. It's a little bit like the Old Testament story of King David, and he was offered some animals to to perform an act of worship and sacrifice, and David's reply was, no, I'm not gonna offer to the Lord something which cost me nothing. No, actual sacrificial service as worship to God. I want to be part of a people like that. I want to be part of the church that lives like that. And what God can do through his people who follow Jesus' example of sacrificial service is unlimited. It's powerful. It's love and action. Jesus said, greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends, and that's what Jesus did. And that's what he's calling us to do. So the greatest in the kingdom is a slave to all and serves all, like Jesus did, not lording it over. And so the chapter begins with the gospel. It goes on with a teaching on true service in the kingdom, being like the Son of Man who came to serve And it ends with two seeing blind men. What did the blind men see? In Matthew 20, 29, the chapter concludes thus. As they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. So again, follow the the people in the story. Who, who, Who are they? What happened? Who are they? Uh, It's the crowd now. 
They're leaving Jericho. Don't forget everything we just talked about. Jesus prophetically explained that he was going to die and be raised again from the dead, exactly how he was going to die, by whom he was going to be tried. And he taught the disciples about service. And in Matthew 20, verse 30, it says, Two blind men sitting by the road, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out loud, Lord, have mercy on us, Son of David. The crowd sternly told them to be quiet. And they cried out all the more, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. We have thus far seen who the Son of Man is from Daniel 7. But do you and I, like the blind men, do you and I know who the Son of David is? Twice these blind men cry out. Both the high exalted title, Lord, and the messianic defined title, Son of David, to Jesus as he's walking by. In verse 32, it says, Jesus stopped and called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. I'm going to argue, this is just Corey's interpretation. Whenever I say something, that's just my opinion. I make it clear that I'm just telling you what I'm thinking. All right? I'm going to say this. They already had vision. They already had sight. They might have been physically blind, but they could see Jesus for who he was. So when they said to him, with an attitude and voice of faith, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened, they already knew something of who he was and what he could do. And they called him by name, Son of David. Moved with compassion. And this literally moves me. He's on his way to the cross. He knows he's going to die. He knows he's walking into the proverbial lion's den or shark pool. He knows that they're going to put him under trial, falsely accuse him, and they're going to kill him. Jesus knows the eternal plan of God. And he has compassion. Enough to stop. Okay, guys, what do you want? <laughs> Give us our sight. And Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and followed him. The quintessential gospel phrase for discipleship. They followed him. Y'all, this isn't just compassion on people who are needy. This is compassion from the king, the son of man, the son of God, the son of David, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, who could have said, I got more important things to do. Don't you know I'm going to go carry out the Father's will that was planned for eternity? He could have listened to some of those people who said, tell them to be quiet, put them off to the side. But does this not reveal unto us the glorious love and compassion of our Savior on the way to the cross to have compassion enough to stop and to heal two blind men who could see already? We read the scriptures so fast. We don't take time to stop and meditate and see who is Jesus and what can Jesus do for you? And who are you and I called to be in Jesus Christ? What do they mean by son of David? One of the most important chapters in your Old Testament is 2 Samuel 7. I call it the Davidic addendum to the covenant. It's when... Nathan the prophet comes to David, and it's beautiful irony. This is, I hope you recall the story if you want to look it up, 2 Samuel 7. I'm going, to, I'm going to start in verse 11 as I recount the story, but this is to the point in history when David says, I want to build a temple for God, because the ark has been roaming about in um, the tabernacle, and David wants to build this more permanent place as a temple for God. 
And the irony is this. It's, it's beautiful irony. God, through the prophet Nathan, says to David, you want to build me a house? You, you, your hands are bloody. I'm not going to let you build me a house. But again, Corey's terms, I'm going to one-up you. I'm going to build you a house. Think about that. Think about that. David the king saying, I want to build God a house, the temple, for worship. And God's saying, I'm going to build God, Yahweh, eternal creator, saying, I'm going to build your house. And this is how he says it. Starting partway through 2 Samuel 7, 11, The Lord also declares to you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up, uh, I will raise up your descendant after you. He will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. In most immediate context, clearly, we understand that that's Solomon. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of sons of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I reproved from before you. Your house, this is 2 Samuel 7, 16, and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words all this vision, and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. And so God says to David, I'm going to build your house, and how long will it last? Forever. So, biblically now, Understanding our Old Testament, understanding Matthew, how, how Jesus fulfills all of it. Today we've seen Son of Man who fulfills Daniel 7. Who has a kingdom that is eternal. And now we see two blind men crying out twice, Son of David. Jesus is in the lineage of King David. Flip over to Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. Son of David, son of Abraham. So we have two blind men who are using the messianic title. Messianic for the word Messiah, which means Christ or King. Two blind men saying to Jesus on his way to the cross. Son of David, have mercy on us. Do you know who he is? And have you cried out to him to have mercy on you? He is son of David. He is son of man. He's in the lineage of covenant father, son of Abraham. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he's going to the cross for you and for me. And it's God's eternal plan that he would do so. And he would be raised again from the dead to live and to reign forever. Are you in his kingdom? Are you one of his? Am I one of his? Have we received Jesus the King as our personal Lord and Savior, knowing all of who he is and knowing what he did? that he went to the cross to pay for our sins and he rose again from the dead so that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Have you personally cried out to Jesus like the blind men did? But this time you have more knowledge than they had. You know what Jesus went and fulfilled. And have you prayed to Jesus cried out to him, Lord, save me. Have you believed he died on the cross for your sins? Has there ever been a time in your life when you personally cried out to Jesus, Lord, save me? I want to encourage us as we, I believe it or not, I've, I've tried to plan preaching all 20 chapters of Matthew thus far just so that we can do Matthew 21 next Sunday. The triumphal entry. But as a community, as a church, I just have an encouragement for you in the next two or three weeks. 
One might be, this might be a great time to go back and just read the Gospel of Matthew from beginning to end now. It's, it's, it's only 20 chapters thus far, 28 chapters together. Read the whole Gospel of Matthew so that this Easter, this Easter, when we celebrate Easter as a community, we are all on the same page, literally. What a beautiful community, body life, unity that might provide in our worship. And the other thing is, is next Sunday, here in-house, uh, when the service is conclu- concluded on live stream, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper in remembrance of uh, how Jesus took uh, the Passover on the, on the night before he was to be crucified, and he celebrated the Lord's Supper with his followers. And then on Easter Sunday, that tank up behind me is going to be full of water. And if you would like to be baptized as a Christian, because you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you are a born-again Christian and want to be baptized as a believer, we will celebrate baptism on Easter Sunday. Why is that so beautiful? Because we're going to be celebrating the day Jesus rose from the dead. And that's what baptism is about. That a person who knows Jesus Christ has died to self, died to sin, been buried with Christ, and raised to new life in Jesus Christ. All teaching from Romans chapter 6. So my prayer and hope is that this Easter, as a community in our church, we are going to celebrate and worship Jesus maybe like never before. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your gospel. We thank you that you knew full well ahead of time before the foundation of the world You knew it all. Lord, I pray that you save people from their sin this Easter. I pray that people would hear your truth, your gospel, your voice, hear it very personally, and turn to you in saving faith, believing in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and that you will take them into salvation and into your kingdom to live for you all the days of their lives and on into eternity. Lord, I pray as a community, as a church, we would be re-centered every single Easter upon the gospel itself, the gospel which is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. The gospel, which is the glory of God in Jesus Christ, died, buried, and risen from the dead. The gospel, which alone can save, and that we would be servants, true servants in your kingdom of one another and of your gospel. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.